Welcome to the final video on the Arado 234. We have covered a lot of ground already so far and I want to finish this series out by covering some important topics outside of what we've discussed to date along with some additional tips. As discussed in video 1, the 234 did no operational level bombing using the Lopeful 7 bomb site. So if you're a historical purist, level bombing with the 234 as it's presented in IL-2 is off the table. Instead of requiring the player to use the Lopeful 7 in conjunction with the PDS-11 autopilot, the 234 modeled in IL-2 just goes to auto level when you access the bomb site. I think the PDS-11 is modeled very well, but it also reveals the unrealistic nature of the universal auto level function available on all aircraft, and it kind of diminishes the novelty of autopilot systems on the few aircraft that have it. I'm just as guilty as anybody else of using and abusing auto level in all kinds of aircraft, but I would be fine if they removed it across the board because there's already a way to keep your aircraft level and it's called trim. I would welcome the challenge of level bombing using the PDS-11 autopilot in conjunction with the Lufthansa 7, but until that day, we're stuck using the standard bombsite approach, unrealistic as it is. In IL-2, the 234 bomb loadout options include bombs mounted on wing racks, and there's video of wing-mounted bombs on an actual aircraft. Funny thing is, though, in this book that presents a daily diary of KG-76 combat missions between December 44 and May 45, based on unit records provided by 234 pilot and KG-76 Staffel Captain Dieter Lukacs, there is not a single mention of a 234 dropping anything other than a single belly bomb, either an SC-500, SC-1000, SC-250, or an AB-500 airdrop container containing 24 SD-15 fragmentation bombs. Obviously, it had the capability to carry extra bombs on the wing racks, but I've yet to find any written description of an Arado 234 combat mission where the aircraft dropped multiple bombs. What's interesting, however, is that on many missions, KG-76 pilots were dropping Trielin bombs, which were a special bomb variant similar to the British Torpex bombs. Trielin bombs were originally designed for employment exclusively against freighter ships, and purportedly, a Trielin SC-500 bomb had the explosive effect of an SC-1000. The Trielin bombs were available in the SC-1500 and 250 weights. I can only guess the Luftwaffe must have had a large number of these bombs lying around in the final months, and with no shipping targets within realistic operational range, as the news tightened around Germany, they shipped them over to KG-76. I haven't seen any exact numbers for what percentage of dropped ordnance tree limb bombs accounted for, but from the frequency it's mentioned, it would appear KG-76 234s were dropping tree limb bombs on at least half of all combat missions. So it's probably a moot point, and I'm not holding my breath to ever see a tree limb bomb modeled in IL-2, but it is an ordnance type historically relevant to this aircraft that is not represented in the game. And the AB-500 container is also missing from IL-2, but if it's modeled anything like the P-Tabs were with the IL-2 1943 variant, probably better not to spend any time on it. Historically, the 20mm gondola was mounted on two night fighter aircraft that scored no air kills, and on one reconnaissance aircraft flown by pilot Eric Sommer, who obtained the gondola from a local night fighter unit. On two occasions, he had opportunities to engage enemy fighter aircraft and F-5 Lightning in a Spitfire, but did not score any hits. The only other mention I've seen of guns mounted on the 234 for operational use was on the aircraft of a pilot, Captain Friedrich Harries, who allegedly took it upon himself to have several machine guns mounted above and behind the pilot's seat. So in the game, the gondola is a cool option to have, I guess. I personally never used it, and to be honest, I would have preferred that time and effort spent on something more historically relevant like a Trielin bomb, but that's just me. The 234's maximum bomb loadout is about half of what a JU-88A4 or Heinkel 111 can potentially carry, but those loadouts are a lot to get off the ground. If you do a comparison using the more common 88 and 111 go-to loadouts, it can carry about 75% of what the 88 and 111 typically carry. It has a lower max bomb capacity compared to the JU-88C6 and a slightly higher capacity than a 110, 410, or Focke-Wulf 190A6 or A8. But unlike these aircraft, it has no capacity for carrying several small bombs. As a level bomber, it's not much different from an 88 or a 111, except everything happens a lot quicker as we'll discuss shortly. As a glide bomber, the BZA periscope is similar in operation to the Stu V5 on the ME410 and operates under the same limitations. It requires wind and target elevation input and requires the attack run to be done along the wind line to ensure accuracy. 
One difference is the pipper appears in the BZA scope at a shallower dive angle at altitudes above 2,000 meters, which is higher than where I typically see it appear in the Stu V5, unless you dive the 410 at a very steep angle, as discussed in this previous video on the 410. The 234 has very limited utility as a low-level multi-pass attack platform compared to these other Luftwaffe aircraft types due to its higher speed, a maximum bomb load of only three bombs or two bombs in a 20 millimeter gondola, and being tied to the wind line on each bomb pass. Therefore, in the areas of flak strafing or making rapid target adjustments during attacks, and self-defense in low-level encounters with enemy fighters, the 234 is nowhere near as efficient as these other aircraft types. In real life, the Arado 234 did not stop or even significantly hinder the Allied ground advance. It was a harassment bomber, and I think that is a role it fills pretty well in IL-2. You're not going to show up at a target area like you're in a fully loaded IL-2 and take out the entire target area by yourself. So for you guys with that compulsive obsession to make a difference and win that whole map single-handedly, you're not going to do that in this aircraft. I keep my metrics for success in the 234 very simple. If the bomb landed where I aimed it and I land the aircraft, it was a success. Historically, the real headline about the 234 was that it could consistently and successfully operate over a Western European airspace dominated by Allied fighters. In an IL-2 multiplayer, that is also where the 234 really excels. Single pass level bomb or glide bomb attacks followed by a lightning quick exit out of the target area. That's what makes the 234 great. If you're doing ground attack in any of these other aircraft and a late war enemy fighter takes an interest in you, the odds are not in your favor unless you're a dogfighting whiz in a Dora or K4. If you take anything away from the previous three videos in this series, I hope you understand that if you know your aircraft and fly with a smart mission plan, the odds are overwhelmingly in your favor to make it back in one piece when flying the 234. Like I said before, this is the one ground attack platform you can consistently fly by yourself in multiplayer and live to tell the tale. And if you're like me and occasionally enjoy doing ground attack in multiplayer, but don't feel like talking to anybody while you're doing it, it's fucking awesome. For this section, I'm assuming you know your way around a bomb site in BZA Periscope. If you don't, my friend Flyus 747 has done excellent tutorials on both, and the links are in the description section. The big question that often comes up during mission planning is whether to level bomb or glide bomb a target. If you're going for historical accuracy, you must glide bomb. If you're going for an optimized mission plan and operational efficiency, most of the time level bombing is the better choice for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, when you glide bomb with the BZA, you are tied to an attack run that runs along the wind line, and that wind direction often will not coincide with the ideal attack run direction. You may have danger zones between the IP and the target, and you may have to execute an extreme turn after bombs out to get on egress heading. When level bombing, you have more freedom to select IP and attack run direction because the bomb site can be adjusted for a crosswind. Secondly, as I stated in video 2B, if you glide bomb a target deep behind the lines, you have to fly a low level egress across enemy territory, and you're running an interception risk from any enemy fighter along your egress path with an altitude advantage. So that limits glide bombing to only those target areas near the front line, where enemy fighters will be less tempted to follow you at low altitude into your territory when you egress out of the target area. When you level bomb, you are at a high altitude after bombs out. You should be at full power, and I hope I made that point clear in previous videos. The potential enemy fighter threat is mainly from an aircraft at a higher altitude than you, and you have plenty of altitude to execute a high-speed evasive dive to counter that threat. Sometimes I hear people say, they prefer to glide bomb because you don't have to climb as high as you do to level bomb, but it's not quite that simple. The 234 offers two capabilities to you when glide bombing. First, the BZA periscope allows you to drop bombs from 2K altitude or higher to stay above the light flak umbrella, and the UMO4 jet engines give you the capability to come off bomb run at a speed of 920 to 950 kph, or slightly under 900 kph if outside air temperature at sea level is below zero to avoid entering mock tuck. To make good use of those capabilities, you are going to have to start the glide bomb attack from pretty much the same altitude range as a level bomb attack. But maybe conditions don't require that degree of hardcore attack run approach. Maybe the flak in that server is not much of a threat and you don't need to drop above 2K. And or maybe you have evaluated the enemy fighter threat as minimal and you don't need to come screaming off the target area riding the periphery of Mach Tuck. 
So you certainly can drop bombs at a lower altitude when the flak threat is low, and when the enemy fighter threat is low, your initial egress speed out of the target area is not important. In some of those cases, you may only need to climb to 2,000 or 2,500 meters. Now, we're not quite done with guy bombing yet, but I want to quickly touch on initial point or initial position or IP selection, which is extremely important to both level and glide bombing, but for slightly different reasons. The IP is the point from where you will fly a specific azimuth directly to the target area, and that IP to target azimuth is not something you want to just look at and estimate. I recommend using the brand new map plotting tool to obtain an exact azimuth. For level bombing, I also recommend picking an IP that is at least 60 kilometers from the target area. The 234 is literally twice as fast as the JU-88 or Heinkel 111 on the attack run. Everything just happens a lot quicker, and you need time to run through your attack run tasks, like locating the target area in the bomb site, and making sure all those last minute adjustments to aircraft speed and wind direction are done properly. There is very little time to fix mistakes. For glide bombing, things are a little different. You have no bomb site settings to deal with, but you do have to acquire the target area and be on the wind line while also being lined up on the target. The sooner you can check these blocks during the attack run, the better. And syncing up attack direction with the wind line usually requires making some heading adjustments, and that can take some time. So the farther back you put the IP, the more time you have to complete these tasks. I normally pick an IP when I'm glide bombing about 40 to 50 kilometers away from the target area. Now I'm going to show you a quick demonstration of how to get the BZA site picture aligned with both target area and wind line. In this example, the wind direction is from 187 degrees to 07 degrees. I arrived at the IP located about 50 kilometers north of the target area, turned to 187 degrees, and then acquired the target area. And I can see the target area is over here to the left, which means I'm too far to the right. So in essence, I'm here when I should be here, and I need to adjust to the left and I'm off by quite a bit, so I turn to the left approximately 90 degrees off of my attack run azimuth, and a 90 degree turn accomplishes two things. It provides maximum adjustment in the shortest amount of time, and doesn't decrease the distance between you and the target area, so you're not spending the entire attack run fighting to get your wind line aligned with the target area. So I hold that 90 degree offset for about 15 to 20 seconds and then come back to a 187 degree heading and I see I held that left offset a tad too long and now I'm slightly left of the target area, but fairly close at this point. And I can make small adjustments from this point forward while moving toward the target area. I turn right about 40 degrees, hold that for a few seconds and then come back to the left on a 187 heading and I can see I now have the vertical crosshair on the target area while also being on the wind line. The point of the attack run where you plan to begin to dive is predicated on the altitude you plan to release bombs and the airspeed you want to have at the point of bomb release. I'm going to focus on the worst case scenario of flak and enemy fighter being at high threat levels. So I want to exit the target area above the light flak umbrella and I want to be at the highest speed possible at the moment of bomb release without entering Mach Tuck. Running at full power with a true airspeed somewhere between 600 and 700 kph at dive start at 15 degrees outside air temperature at sea level, I will begin the dive at these distances from the target area, from these respective altitudes. I set the contact altimeter to 2400 meters because that gives me 400 meters of cushion above the light flak umbrella of 2K in case I drop a little low. You want to dive at an angle that will match up your planned bomb drop altitude with your planned speed at bomb drop. It takes some offline practice to get these two objectives synchronized on a consistent basis. You can do the attack manually or use the autopilot pitch and yaw functions or, and this is my technique, turn on all the autopilot functions except pitch. I then make pitch corrections with a stick and left right corrections with the autopilot yaw control. This works best for me. It's also how I do it with the Stu V5 and the ME410. Engaging the autopilot yaw and roll controls keeps your wings level at bomb drop, so you won't throw the bomb left or right. The reason I prefer to use the stick instead of autopilot pitch control is because the autopilot pitch control has a very slow response to input, so I'm constantly overcorrecting and undercorrecting my dive angle. With the stick, I have immediate response to input and therefore much more fine control over the dive angle throughout the attack dive. I have found that what works for me is keeping this portion of the site on the target and then watching my rate of descent 
and adjusting pitch up or down while keeping the target within this range. And it does take some practice to get comfortable bouncing between the scope picture and the cockpit airspeed gauge and altimeter while on the attack dive. And when the pipper appears at the bottom of the scope, knowing whether to go more shallow or steep based on current altitude and airspeed. When outside air temperature at ground level is higher than zero degrees, I'm looking for a speed between 900 and 930 kph at bomb release. Below zero, I back these dive start distances back by about five kilometers because I do not want to exceed 900 kph at any point and risk entering Mach Tuck. So as you can see, the dive portion of glide bombing can get a little complicated when you are looking to get a specific drop altitude and exit speed. And the last thing you want to be doing is still trying to get lined up with the target during the dive. That's why it's important to put the IP at a sufficient distance from the target area to give you the time to get that right prior to diving. Many times in multiplayer, things do not go as planned for any number of reasons and you may find yourself forced to drop on a target where you're not perfectly on the wind line. In those cases, you have to offset your aim against the wind. How much offset is a giant can of worms I've discussed many times in previous videos and it depends on your drop altitude, wind speed, and wind angle. And there are just no generic answers for this. All I can tell you is use your best judgment. Overcast or heavy cloud conditions can sometimes present the perfect cover for level bombing. Fighter guys tend to fly around right under cloud base so they can't get jumped, and if you fly right under cloud base too, they can't see you. Better yet, if you stay up in the clouds and pop down occasionally to verify your current position, you stay invisible. I still recommend flying a safe ingress route as we discussed in video 2B, and once you're over the IP and transitioning to the attack run, you're going to have to fly at an altitude just under the clouds, but with clear visibility from the cockpit and bomb site to see the target area. Now that doesn't mean flying 50 or 100 meters below cloud base, but just low enough to see the ground. And I don't mind seeing a little cloud mist in my bomb site to stay up in the clouds and be as invisible as possible. Whether or not you can pull this off depends on two factors, the altitude of the cloud base and the response time of the AAA in that server. Your bomb site is effective all the way down to 1300 meters, but you have to also factor in target elevation, which we'll hit on shortly. If the clouds are too low to use the bomb site, you can level bomb with the BZA periscope, but you have to be on the wind line. If you're below 2,000 meters, you will be in range of all AAA guns within the target area. If you're below 3,000 meters, you will be in range of the medium and heavy flak, and you will always be in heavy flak range at any altitude. If you try this in the Tactical Air War server, the flak will probably tear you a new asshole before you even get bombs out. In the Finnish Virtual Pilot server, they probably won't start shooting at you until after bombs are out. In combat box, that's also usually the case for non-airfield targets, but for allied airfields at least, it looks like the flak has been amped up a bit in terms of accuracy. A few days back, I did a solo level bomb on an allied airfield from 5K, and I started taking heavy flak a long way out from the airfield, and there was a huge cloud between my 234 and the airfield. I couldn't even see the fucker, but the heavy flak was popping within 10 or 15 meters of my aircraft, and I got damage to both engines from the high number of near misses. A week before that, I got a wing popped off on egress away from an airfield at 2.9k altitude by a Soviet 61k gun. So it's something to keep in mind if you decide to try this on an allied airfield in combat box. If you can get around those two factors, it's a pretty effective technique. You can drop bombs and disappear back into the mist like a ghost. But since the flak AI can see you in the clouds, and hopefully soon they will fix that problem, not like the game's been around for 10 years or something, but since the flak is shooting at you as if there is no cloud cover, you have to do evasive maneuvers on initial egress until you're out of flak range. That can be very problematic to do in clouds with zero visibility. If you preset your autopilot pitch to fly level, as soon as you pop up into the clouds after bombs are out, you can turn on autopilot and make left and right evasive turns using autopilot yaw and stay level while doing so. Using cloud cover in this way will get you in and out of the target areas even when they're heavily defended by enemy players, and sometimes the playbacks are awesome to watch. 
you may also find that at these lower altitudes you can accurately hit targets you might not try for at higher altitudes. So light clouds don't present much of a visibility problem for bombing and as we've seen there are ways to use overcast and heavy clouds to your advantage but the worst clouds to deal with are the fucking medium clouds they're not thick enough to hide you but are very effective at concealing the target area the IP and the space between the IP and the target area and the term medium is very general the clouds may be roughly evenly distributed across the sky or they may be as thick as hell in one spot and wide open in another when you're level bombing you just never know what you're gonna get until you get close to the target area if you can find it if you're glide bombing and coming in on your attack run from above the clouds, many times it's going to be very difficult to know until the last minute whether your heading on the wind line also lines up with the target area, unless the area on your wind line just happens to be cloud free. I'm not saying it can't be done. In this example, I didn't see the bridge target until very late and had to make a correction and drop bombs about 8 degrees off the wind line and still lucked out and hit that bridge. But glide bombing through the clouds like that is mostly a very iffy proposition. So in conclusion, medium clouds suck. It's a dice roll on whether you will have the visibility to hit your target. And if you can't see the target area until the last minute, the Arado 234's high speed will often make last second heading adjustments impossible. If my indicated aircraft speed is in between two 10 kph hash marks, I always set the speed dial to the higher hash mark. A couple of months ago I was looking at a Discord channel, I, I don't remember which one, and somebody posted that it's not that important to factor target elevation into your bomb site altitude setting. And I was thinking, you're smoking fucking crack, bro. There's a reason you have a target elevation input for the BZA periscope. It matters. And it also needs to be accounted for on the bomb site target elevation dial when you're level bombing. If the target elevation is 250 meters and you don't have that dialed in, your elevation is 250 meters off. It's that simple. Level bombing is hard enough, especially in the 234. No need to fuck yourself with incorrect target elevation input. Some servers provide target elevation info and some don't. I just use the mission editor to get that information as I discussed at the 7 minute 30 second mark in this video on the ME410. Now I want to tell you about the one time I got shot down by an enemy fighter while flying the 234 in the Finnish server. It was a Rido 234 mission number 105. Things had been going great and I had gotten complacent, started taking unnecessary chances and not giving enemy fighter aircraft the respect they deserve. There was a depot close to the front line and all the front line target areas and it was a pretty populated server that day. I had already level bombed that depot once using a good route plan and I saw the usual shit show going on below me over the target area and instead of taking that as a cue that I should be bringing my A game to this area of the map, on the second run I got lazy and decided to just fly a short route right across the front line, drop bombs, turn around and come back. So that plan was a combination of two dumbass ideas right off the bat, and to make it worse, the outside air temperature at sea level was below zero, and I was lugging three SC500, so I was coming in super slow at around 5K altitude. Right after bombs out, I saw a tempest fly by from 2 o'clock to 12 o'clock, and I turned around, started to dive, and I hit the mission recorder button so I could watch the playback later of me smoking away from this motherfucker, and right after I hit that button, smack, 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 the tempest was hammering me. It happened so quick, I thought there was a second fighter I didn't see, but it was actually the same Tempest. I had misjudged that guy's energy state and how quickly he could turn a 180 and get to me. So after thinking about it, it was easy to acknowledge that was a really dumb fucking mission plan to start with, but I was also thinking about a quicker way to reverse direction after bombs out. Now going into a split S immediately after bombs out on a level bomb run isn't anything new, but it just works better with a 234 better than any other ground attack aircraft because it will get you to 900 kph and higher in a very short amount of time. This technique is something you might want to practice a little offline because if your split S maneuver is too slow, you may go into mock tuck. If it's too quick, you may snap a wing because the 234 has a pretty low G limit, similar to that of an A20 or a Heinkel 111. But I've used it in multiplayer a time or two, and it does work pretty well when executed smoothly. The last bombing tip I have for you is what I call the level and troll. And I used to do these a lot with my buddy Flyus 747 when the 234 was first released. This is where you take a three bomb loadout, level bomb a target with one or two bombs, and then go do a glide bomb attack on a target near friendly lines with your remaining bombs. This works really well against those frontline airfields and finish that don't have any AAA protection. 
This takes additional planning because you're doing two missions inside of one flight and your exit direction from the first target has to sync up with the IP for the second target, which must be on the wind line. Sometimes map conditions work out for that double mission and sometimes they don't, but when everything comes together, it can be fun. When you fly without TechnoChat, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. 8400 RPM's nominal power lines up with 94% power in TechnoChat. You can fly around at 8400 RPM's all day long, but if you're at 8450 RPM's or 95%, you will eventually fry an engine. The RPM gauges in the 234 are not as detailed as those gauges in other aircraft, and it's not easy to see a difference between 8400 and 8450 RPM's. So when you go to nominal power and there's no techno chat, be sure you're really at nominal power. Without techno chat, you can still get pretty close to setting the correct wind speed on the BZA wind dial, but inputting accurate target elevation is very problematic to say the least with a dial that spans 6,000 meters across a few centimeters. This problem also plagues the ME410 with the Stu V5 bomb site. If your target elevation is wrong, your bomb is probably not going to land where you aim it, and that error is compounded the higher you drop. I recommend either picking targets that are close to zero elevation or fly a different aircraft. Historically, KG-76 started out trying to fly AR-234s in formation, but quickly dispensed with that method because keeping a formation intact requires people in the front to slow down, which sacrifices the only advantage the aircraft had, speed. And this dilemma is recreated very well in IL-2, and the problem is compounded by a couple of other issues. If you're trying this with a group of people possessing differing levels of experience in the 234, you will likely experience botched engine startups, which can derail the whole mission. It's pretty easy to fly most IL-2 aircraft with a half-assed knowledge of each aircraft's specific details, but the 234 is very unforgiving in that regard. Kind of knowing how to operate the 234 is like kind of knowing how to operate a car. You either have that shit down, inside and out, or you don't. There is no in-between. And if you don't have your shit together, that fact will reveal itself sooner or later. Usually sooner. In flight, you can't yank the throttle up and down to keep your spot in a formation. So unless everybody in the group has a lot of experience with throttle management in the 234, you can expect to see people overshooting the flight lead or inducing engine damage from throttling up too fast or inducing engine failure from throttling down too fast. And if the guys in the back have been running on full power to keep up during ingress, they're not going to have any full power left for egress. KG-76 shifted to a method where the 234s took off separately, half a runway apart, and did not try to stay in formation. Individual pilots followed a flight plan in terms of azimuths and altitudes and were individually responsible for navigation to the target and egress. I believe the KG-76 solution is the way to go in aisle 2. The flight leader briefs the flight plan and everybody flies that plan individually. You don't have to take off half a runway apart, but you also don't have to try to stay in formation. If you can see the other aircraft, that's great. If you can't, it doesn't matter. Everybody's doing their own navigation. If somebody overshoots the flight lead, that's fine too. You're all headed to the same place. The flight leader should keep the flight informed of when he's hitting the waypoints, and most importantly, keep the flight on the same engine management plan. Now I know a lot of guys enjoy the social element of flying as a group and being able to see everybody's aircraft and yak 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 all the way to the target area and back, but all it does is detract from mission effectiveness when everybody's in 234s. What I found personally is that I can deal with the noise distractions when I'm flying any other aircraft, but in the 234 I need every brain cell in my head focused on the mission and aircraft operation, otherwise some aspect of that process will suffer. Historically, the Luftwaffe assigned fighter units to cover airfields while 234s and 262s were taking off and landing. There was no escort on the flight route. In IL-2, a DORA or a 109K4 should be able to stay with the 234s from takeoff to the target, but once you go to full power on egress, you might leave them behind. The only Axis fighter that can do proper escort is the ME262, but you got a better chance of a dick growing out of your forehead than seeing an ME262 in a multiplayer server. Apparently, lots of people tend to complain a lot when they get their asses stomped by somebody flying a faster fighter aircraft, and holy shit, gee fucking whiz, I wonder what that feels like. But the thing is, if you're following a smart mission plan, you don't really need escort. And I would caution you not to fall into the trap of deciding to fly a more risky ingress route simply because you have fighters with you. 
In servers like Combat Box and Finish, enemy fighters have a way of quickly sucking up all your fighter protection and leaving you out there hanging. I see dogfighting like a boxing match or a ballroom brawl, depending on the number of people involved, but I see single pass ground attack like a bank heist, and you want to be in and out of there before the cops show up. Once a dogfight breaks out in your vicinity, it's like a bank teller pushing the alarm button or somebody calling the cops, and all that attention you don't want is headed your way because those opposing players are telling all their buddies in voice comms and team chat where you are. I've seen that play out more times than I care to remember, and it's not worth the time saved. With or without escort, be smart about your ingress route. So that's it. If you watched all four Arado 234 videos from start to finish, congratulations. And I thank you for your time, all three of you. I sincerely hope you walk away from this with some useful information that will make you untouchable in the Arado 234. As always, thanks for watching. This is HVB. Peace out.